you mind if I still just a little bit more cider? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Good evening, everyone. Hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Peacedale Museum of Art and Culture. I'm Lisa Fiore, president of the Board of Trustees for South County's oldest museum. As trustees, we are entrusted with the preservation of this eclectic, international, and multicultural collection. Our mission's focus is education. For school-aged children, we have our talented and entertaining vice president, Mary Cocock Brown, <laughs> assisted <laughs> by fellow trustees, Louise Weaver, who's on YouTube, <laughs> Betsy Cook, who's here tonight, Linda Hennessy, right next to her, and our former volunteer and our newest board member, newest trustee, Jan Rothstein. <laughs> Along with our administrator, Julie Wardwell. Yay. It is critical for our children to understand and appreciate world, world cultures and to pique their interest as they continue to learn about the world we live in. Education outreach for our members and the public is also achieved by our stellar speaker series, Catherine, and newsletters. Kudos to Karen Ellsworth, fellow board trustee who is responsible for the speaker series and is our editor creator of our newsletter. Karen. <laughs> okay. Tonight we continue our fall speaker series with a fascinating look at Puritan colonists through the lens of an archaeobotanist, Catherine Reinhardt. Catherine examined the artifacts recovered from the only 17th century Plymouth Colony house ever to have been completely excavated. Catherine is with the Archaeological and Historical Services, a cultural resource management firm in Stores, Connecticut. Tonight we will hear about the discoveries of the Waterman's house site and how the Waterman's family's plant consumption practices reflect <coughs> some of the earliest evidence of how the Puritan colonists began to evolve into the people we now call New England Yankees. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. Um, I was very honored when Karen reached out, um, and you all seem like a lovely bunch of folks, some faces that I recognize as well. Um, and so without further ado, let's get into it. So most of us know the pilgrims in Plymouth Colony from the history we were taught in school or from books or articles we've read. A majority of this information comes from historical document research with little in the way of archaeological material culture available to interpret. This is due in part to a lack of sites dating to the first period of settlement, 1620 to about 1660, being confidently identified on the landscape as well as to the fact that when such sites have been found, what is left to be recovered is not well preserved. The 2013 excavations conducted by Archaeological and Historical Services at the circa 1638 Waterman House site in Marshfield, Massachusetts, offers us the opportunity to examine the daily lives of English colonists from the ground up. While the burning of the house in the mid-1640s would have been a trial for the family, uh, the level of preservation the burning event created at this site allowed for the reconstruction of not only colonial architecture, but also intimate details of colonial life. The most exciting aspect of this site for me as an archaeobotanist, however, is that these conditions afford the rare opportunity to investigate a facet of the human experience that all of us are familiar with, food. For those of us living in today's world with a wide diversity of cuisines and foods at our fingertips, we might only consider a meal within the context of nutritional value, convenience, and food preferences. These are, of course, important factors influencing what we eat and when, However, whether or not you are conscious of the why behind your choosing to eat something, your food choices are intimately tied to the cultural history of and your personal experiences with meals and ingredients that make you who you are. Excuse oh. me. Yes. Could you read a little bit? Slower? Slower. Yes. I, I heard myself talking. I was like, you know, I'm going way too fast. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, again, 
food makes you who you are, you're eating it, you're consuming it, it reflects who your past ancestors were. As an archaeobotanist, I explore the origins of the foods we eat by looking at the plants consumed by past peoples and, by proxy, the identity and culture of those people. Plants are particularly well situated for use in the study of cultural changes due to the many uses we have for them, their diversity, the ways we have modified them through cultivation, and their influence upon us. They nourish us, heal us, and act as a way for us to connect ourselves to not only the surrounding landscape, but to each other as well. In the case of the Waterman House site, and by proxy, Plymouth Colony, and Karen told me some of you are Plymouth Colony descendants, so welcome. Um, assumptions that the identity of colonizers, particularly the performance of identity through food consumption, was static and reflected colonial mistrust or disgust toward New World foods, and it's challenged here. So when I began analyzing this assemblage way back in 2019, I started with very basic questions. However, with every sample analyzed, new plant taxa encountered, and the more I engaged with colonial accounts and European botanical literature from the 16th and 17th centuries, in addition to the available body of literature produced by historians and other archaeologists, my questions began to morph into something quite a bit different. And now my research aims to answer the following. Do the plant taxa recovered at Waterman reflect multi-directional effects of colonization on foodways in New England? In other words, is it possible to witness exchanges of knowledge between indigenous and English people? Um, do these plant remains reflect contemporary accounts indicating English colonists' initial intent to recreate the familiar and affirm their English identity in the new world? And finally, a common theme throughout current research studying European colonization of America is an underlying assumption that the identity of colonizers particularly the performance through food consumption was static. So what do the results have to tell us about how colonists perceived, adapted to life in the new world through the lens of food? So the first period of settlement in New England was one of dynamic, uh, dynamic change and upheaval in the region. From the early days of exploration to the establishment of Plymouth Colony in 1620 and afterward, English and indigenous peoples encountered a multitude of challenges involved in the creation of the colonial experience. Among the culture shocks, cultural exchanges, conflicts, and ecological changes also occurred the establishment of new ways of living. Of the many facets of colonial life, the adaptation of new world foods and technology into the traditional English diet and agricultural system was central to the, in, central to the colonial experience. Among the culture shocks, cultural exchanges, conflicts, and ecological changes also, excuse me, of the many facets of colonial life, the adaptation of New World foods and technology into the traditional English diet and agricultural system was central to the survival of the colonists. That's where I was going with that. William Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation starkly illustrates the centrality of food in colonial life, as his account goes scarcely more than a page or two without mentioning victuals or the lack thereof. For Plymouth Colony, many of the assumptions about the New World would be proven false, and their traditional understanding of what was good for consumption was challenged. Contemporary accounts are rife with religious overtones of concern that the savage ways I'm sorry. It's so fast. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's that fast. Yes. So that's actually coming after I give a little bit of background. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So I'm going to look at you as I'm saying these, these next few sentences, and then you can tell me if I'm too fast still. How about that? <laughs> I'm so sorry, y'all. <laughs> Rapid fire. I'm sorry. Oh, you're OK. I'm, I'm here to tell you guys about my research. So I want to make sure you all hear me and understand. So I'm going to get some things out of my hands, too. Hmm. So for Plymouth Colony, many of the assumptions about the new world would be proven false, and their traditional understanding of what was good for consumption was challenged. 
Contemporary accounts are rife with religious overtones of concern that the savage ways of Native Americans and the untamed New England wilderness would devour them and make them less English. In a Plymouth, Plymouth plantation, Bradford expresses fears that the wilderness would consume and utterly to ruinate colonists and convert them into savages as well. Nearly half of the original 102 pilgrims had perished by March of 1621 when Samoset arrived at their settlement. Through Samoset, the pilgrims were able to mediate peace with the Wampanoags and Tisquantum, who many of us know as Squanto, was sent to them and became one of the most important early agricultural advisors to teach the pilgrims their agricultural techniques and subsistence strategies. This was a critical turning point in the existence of Plymouth Colony because, unlike the well-tilled English soil the colonists knew, uh, the coastal Massachusetts ground would require time and means before it would successfully grow the European crop seeds they had brought with them. Without traditional English farming equipment, such as plows and oxen, as well as a lack of understanding the New England seasons and colder climate, their peas and wheat would continue to come to no good. Tisquantum and other Wampanoag advisors taught them how to sow maize, beans, and squash in mounds of, with river herring as fertilizer in the fallow fields near their settlement. These fields had once been cultivated by Tisquantum's village, Patuxet, before they were decimated years prior by an epidemic. The colonists were also taught the seasonal cycles of their new home and instructed to plant when the leaves of the white oak tree are as big as the ear of a mouse which is very cute to think about. <laughs> uh, these basic indigenous techniques were incorporated into the seasonal rituals of English yeoman agriculture and replicated throughout the colonies. This adaptation of indigenous strategies by Plymouth and other New England colonies allowed for the realization of the solid sufficiency they sought in spite of stress put on their food supplied by multiple arrivals of new colonists or particulars. These groups were often comprised of lusty men uh, who did not adhere to the puritanical vision of a cooperative community and offered little in return to Plymouth Colony except for extra mouths to feed. This added pressure to Plymouth's food supply led Bradford to allow disgruntled families to cultivate food for themselves on personal allotments of land instead of for the common kettle on shared land. This action, coupled with the realization that outside of the constrained political and religious boundary of Plymouth laid rich marshlands teeming with natural resources and more fertile soil, opened the door for expansion and the subsequent establishment of satellite communities in the region like Marshfield. Initially, land was granted to select colonists with the stipulation that they return to Plymouth during the winter in an attempt to hold on to their original vision of a communal and cohesive society. Marshfield became one of the first of these satellite communities and was first settled around 1630. By 1636, however, the original condition requiring the return of families in the winter was abandoned, and the following year the colony granted a number of 100-acre land grants in the area of Greens Harbor, which is Marshfield. This included Marshfield Neck, and among other families to inherit, inhabit the Neck was the old comer, Governor Edward Winslow, Thomas Bourne and his wife Elizabeth, and eventually Robert Waterman, who married their daughter Elizabeth in 1638. Yes, so the Waterman house is this little dot. Yeah. And if you, so and on this little um, outlay of Massachusetts, so Plymouth is right up around here. So it's a little bit above. So where, where would Plymouth be on the bigger map? I'm sorry? Where would Plymouth be on the bigger map? Um, it would be on this map or this yeah, map? On, on this. So it is right here. It's like right almost on the coast. Um, and if anybody, has anybody been to Marshfield? Yeah. Um, do you know where the Marshfield Airport is? OK. So it's like kind of like on a little spit of land in like some suburban areas. Um, but the airport expanded on top of the Waterman House, <laughs> which is why we did a complete recovery. Also, how am I doing on speed? Am I better? OK. I'm, I'm breathing, I promise. <laughs> Let 
Robert Waterman was a yeoman from Norwich, England, and was living in Salem, Massachusetts Bay Colony by 1636. Through his marriage to Elizabeth Bourne, he became related to some of the most influential old comer families of Plymouth, including the Winslows and the Bradfords. For young Robert, marrying into the Bourne family would have been a great boon and not only offered him social connections, but also allowed him to own land so he could be a freeman. By the time Robert and Elizabeth were married, the house excavated by AHS most likely would have already been constructed on the land gifted to him by his father-in-law, Thomas Bourne. The couple had four sons, and the family was engaged in a variety of agricultural and maritime activities. Robert Waterman's life as a yeoman and his adherence to traditional English agricultural practices is reflected in his probate, which you definitely can't read on this slide, <laughs> uh, from 1653. It lists the family as raising livestock, including pigs, cows, and chickens, and as cultivating crops, including wheat, Indian corn, or maize, and barley. His probate also reveals his household was in keeping with practices of the time by producing cheese, butter, and beer. And in spite, oh yeah. <laughs> And in spite of becoming involved in several legal disputes, um, I was actually just telling Karen, he offered bodily uncleanness to a Sarah Pitney, apparently, and got fined for that. No idea what bodily uncleanness is, but there we are. <laughs> he was a freeman and served the community as a highway surveyor, raider, or tax assessor, on a committee to establish trade with Native Americans, and in multiple elected positions, including as one of Marshfield's two grand jurymen and a representative to the colony's general court in Plymouth. He helped construct a house for Marshfield's first permanent minister and was one of the citizens who donated money to hire the first school teacher there. Little is known about his wife Elizabeth, unfortunately, other than her family connections, that she was forced to sell their homestead on the North River in 1652 to settle her husband's debts, and that she remarried in 1653 to the man that purchased the North River homestead, Thomas Tilden. And now we're getting into the data. The excavation of the Waterman House site was a massive endeavor, and by the end of the project, 132 square meter units had been dug and over 16,000 artifacts recovered. Yeah. 63 features uh, were identified. The ones that are highlighted on this plan map, those are the ones that I analyzed for my thesis. Um, so that includes the pantry, the hearth, um, a subfloor storage pit, and the two palisaded walls that were probably windbreaks. Um, and if anybody's interested in like, more detailed things about the house, Ross Harper has written a wonderful article, and we also have a report out on the site. Uh, and from those 63 features, 398.94 uh, liters of soil were recovered, uh, which is a lot. <laughs> so I did not do all of those. Um, water flotation, if you're not familiar, allows for the recovery of artifacts, faunal remains, and plant remains, my bread and butter, uh, too small to be recovered through on-site dry screening. Analysis of the recovered artifacts reflected the activities of a traditional colonial Yeoman household, as well as material culture evidence like native pottery sherds and copper trade beads exchanged during native European interactions. Uh, through AHS Inc.'s detailed archaeological recording of the house site, uh, it has been interpreted as a small, earthfast house that most likely served as a starter home for the family. The cultural features identified within the home's walls included, as I mentioned, a sunken hearth, so trying to avoid some of that wind, so sinking it down a little bit, a small cellar, and subfloor storage pit. Similar subfloor storage pits associated with excavated 18th century house sites in New England um, have been attributed to vegetable storage, especially root vegetables. So think like your turnips and your potatoes. They didn't have those there in the 17th century, but yes. Um, and the southern wall and the entrance of the home were palisaded. Approximately 4,299 macrobotanical specimens were recovered. So that means not charred wood. Uh, that means seeds and nutshell and all of that. Um, of the 64 plant taxa represented at Waterman, 
maize and wheat kernels, mustard and carrot seeds, and fruits of grape were recovered in the highest densities. The remainder of this assemblage is comprised of a wide diversity of Old World and New World fruits, berries, vegetables, herbs, and grains. As someone who has independently analyzed macrobotanical remains throughout New England for oh, almost a decade now, um, I can definitely say this is by far the largest and most extensive project I've ever taken on. Um, and when I was trying to figure out what to do with this 4,299 specimens of stuff, I had to really think it through how to analyze it. And I realized I needed to look at it through multiple lenses. So we're about to get into that. Um, the first of these analytical lenses required organizing the present taxa into procurement categories described in works by historians like J. Allen Anderson and the English agricultural manuals popularized in the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, if you've never written a 16th, 15th, or 17th century text, give it a try. <laughs> um, Robert Waterman's status as a yeoman is important to the contextualization of this assemblage as the traditional agricultural and plant consumption practices were deeply ingrained in the daily performance of English identity. In New England, colonists did experience the significant differences that existed between regional folk cultures developed in the old world, yet they all shared a similar religious background, political history, seasonal rituals, and hallmarks of English yeoman life, including village settlements, strict field crop rotation, and heavy plow agriculture, and heavy emphasis on the grain. This grain-based diet was supplemented by plants cultivated by the women of the household in kitchen gardens, and to a lesser extent, foraged plants. The recovered plant taxa here clearly illustrate that the Waterman family, and by proxy, their peers in Plymouth, adhered to traditional English subsistence strategies. So if you're having a little bit of trouble like trying to figure out what that chart is telling you, the really, really tall line, that is all the field crops. The little like sort of grayish blue, that's the kitchen garden. And then the lit, like bright blue is the foraged crops. And then black, where there were some that I couldn't get them down to species identifications. So I just kind of had to figure out, I just had to say I can't decide where these came from, <laughs> unfortunately. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these procurement strategies. Plants recovered through foraging practices traditionally made up the smallest portion of the yeoman diet, and this is reflected in the Waterman assemblage. While only accounting for 1% of the entire assemblage, the presence of hickory and acorns vividly illustrates the depth of the colonial diet. In England, uh, they were considered a famine food, uh, especially acorns. Um, there's a really, I don't want to call it lovely, but a very interesting example from Hugh Platt from the 16th century recommended that you mix acorn with brick dust, and that's how you get your food during a famine. What? Uh, with brick dust. Brick, brick, dust. brick. brick. No. yeah, like brick. what you make a house out of, yep. <laughs> yeah, they had a lot of consecutive famines. <laughs> um, in New England, they had been consumed by Native Americans for thousands of years before colonization. Early accounts written by colonists such as Roger Williams and Edward Winslow discuss observing the nut being consumed or having been served acorns when interacting with native people. John Jocelyn, an early English visitor to the region after settlement, described the oil natives made from white oak acorns as excellent, clear, and sweet. Acorns were also some of the first New World foods to be encountered by Plymouth Colony when they arrived. Um, if anybody remembers, the colonists arriving and they're starving and they find some baskets of food. Um, among that were some acorns next to the maize. Um, hickory nuts were originally identified by contemporary European visitors and colonists as a type of walnut. William Wood described them in his 1634 account as something smaller but nothing inferior in sweetness and goodness to the English nut, having no bitter pill. Jocelyn described hickory nuts in both of his accounts, saying that they differ much from ours in Europe, they being smooth, much like a nutmeg in shape, and not much bigger. 
and having a European nut that they could make connections to probably made that a little bit easier for them to want to eat. The foraged fruits represented in the assemblage were readily noted in the accounts of early explorers and colonists as well. In particular, the wild grapes Europeans encountered as they explored the coast of their new home were given special attention. These vines were noted as growing rampant throughout the region, and the English hoped to turn them into wine that could possibly rival that of the beverage produced by French and Spanish vineyards. However, <laughs> they soon found that these New World grapes were not well suited for this purpose due to insufficient sugar content, and they turned their attention to cultivating grape varieties from Europe, which was also a whole kit and caboodle on its own. Um, colonists did not discriminate in their winemaking efforts, though, and often included the cherries, cranberries, huckleberries, strawberries, and blueberries, such as what is it, Waterman, uh, into their wine recipes. Turning again to the accounts of men such as John Pory, Wood, Williams, Winslow, and Jocelyn, all of whom made sure to note the abundance of wild fruits, because they're trying to get people to come over. Uh, the wide diversity of fruits and berries noted in these accounts bolstered the European view of the New England wilderness as a veritable land of plenty. In most cases, these fruits were noted as not inferior to their associated European species, or in some cases, actually superior to. Every colonial home would have relied heavily on their kitchen garden to supply them throughout the growing season with greens, vegetables, and fruits if they included an orchard to their home lot. Historians have noted that kitchen gardens were one of the keys to the success of English settlements in New England. In addition to providing fresh produce for part of the year, a majority of this crop was preserved through drying, pickling, and as pastes and wines as fruits and vegetables ripened throughout the growing season. These plots were tended to by the women of the family, as I said, and the assemblage reflects that Elizabeth Waterman cultivated a wide diversity of food and medicinal plant taxa, with mustard seeds and grapes being recovered in the highest densities. And actually, with the amount of fruits of grapes that we found, um, we're pretty sure the house burned down sometime in the late summer, early fall, because that's when grapes typically ripen, uh, which is kind of a cool thing you can do with bots. Um, the mustard seeds are particularly interesting in the site's assemblage, considering the high density. Um, do I have any gardeners here, by the way? Yeah. Have you ever, has anybody looked at a mustard or like have you planted mustard seeds? Yeah, they're itty bitty. Um, like, um, yeah, almost pinhead size. I recovered 472 mustard seeds alone. <laughs> yep. Uh, there's a reason the masters took me three years, other than COVID. <laughs> um, the spatial distribution of these seeds indicates that the Waterman family either had a store of these seeds waiting to be made into sauce, um, or even serve as evidence of Elizabeth Waterman using Hugh Platt's advice from 1602 for how to make mustard meal by drying the seeds against the fire before grinding them. A comparison of the kitchen garden plants identified here to those listed in John Winthrop Jr.'s 1631 receipt from a grocer in England further reveals that English colonists were successful in their efforts to incorporate this important source of nutrition in New England. Beets, cabbage, carrot, dill, hyssop, new, new onion, pompion, radish, thyme, and violet were all among his purchases intended for New England and are also present here at Waterman. Colonists and visitors alike remarked on the variety and quality of the plant foods produced by English colonial kitchen gardens. Francis, Francis Higginson claimed that the turnips, parsnips, and carrots are both bigger and sweeter than is ordinarily to be found in England. Writing from Massachusetts Bay Colony, William Wood stated that the ground affords very good kitchen gardens for turnips, parsnips, carrots, radishes, and pumpkins. Muskmelons is squatter squashes. Uh, cowcumbers, onions, and whatsoever grows well in England grows as well there, many things bigger and better. Squash and pumpkin, such as those recovered from Waterman, were eaten fresh, 
boiled, incorporated into English dishes, and often preserved by being hung to dry in windows or barns. Both the rinds, uh, which were the most numerable specimen type recovered of squashes and pump pumpkins, um, and the seeds of these were recovered from the Waterman site's cellar and hearth features. And it's pretty possible slash likely that they were in the process of drying some of their rinds to have for the winter and to preserve when the house was burning. Beans from the New World were described at length in 16th and 17th century herbals and were quickly assimilated into the English diet in the Old World as well as in New England. Peas like those recovered at this site are filling, nutritious, and versatile as they preserved easily and required very little processing. Its status as a staple food in England and subsequently New England, New England uh, was also due to it being an inexpensive crop with a high seed to yield ratio. McMahon's study of New England probate records found that the winter supply of vegetables in 17th century households consisted almost entirely of dried peas until the 18th century. So imagine eating peas all winter. In Old England, wild and cultivated fruit trees were seasonal ways to add variety to your subsistence practices, especially for lower and working class folks. In New England, this trend continued as evidenced by accounts written by early explorers and colonists. Furthermore, in Massachusetts Bay, John Endicott's list from 1628 of items to provide to send for New England requested apple and quince kernels, also present here at Waterman, among other fruits. Apples proved to be a critical part of yeoman life in New England, and the fruit is nutritious and versatile, and they were eaten fresh, baked, preserved as applesauce, apple butter, uh, the really appealing sounding apple leather. Um, yeah. <laughs> they were also used to flavor pottages or stews at times. Of all the colonial uses of the apple, hard cider made the largest impact. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, as soon as their orchards began to bear a solid sufficiency of fruit, apples were gathered, processed, and barreled as cider by the men of the family. These orchards required less labor than the sowing and the harvesting of the grains used in beer making, and a family's entire year's worth of cider could be produced in the span of one fall. Um, historian Sarah McMahon's 1984 study, again, I love her work, um, speaks to the continued importance of cider with the frequency of cider allowances in widow's probates matching those of malt, barley, and hops by the 1740s, which is pretty significant. The field supplied yeoman families with grains, which made up the core of their diet. The Waterman assemblage reflects this reliance on grains, including the old world wheat, rye, barley, and oats. Wheat was the most important of these grains and was used in making bread, pottages, and puddings. Unfortunately, as I think if anybody's looked into the history, early colonists had a very difficult time getting their staple crop to grow well in New England soils. It took several seasons before European grains could successfully be grown alongside the New World grain maize. Colonists eventually shifted to growing spring-sown varieties of wheat, which resulted in an expanded wheat production in the 1640s. This did not last long, however. Uh, they got knocked down by the wheat blast, or a black stem rust, and that happened in the 1660s, which really threw them on their rockers. John Winthrop noted in 1634 that the Massachusetts land was aptest for rye and oats, a fact that the English had discovered soon after setting their roots down in the region. Oats were consumed in porridges and pottages and were one of the least desirable English grains. Rye was often seeded alongside wheat to create a combination called meslin and served as a bread grain. And when wheat crops faltered, rye took over as the principal English grain and was often mixed with maize in order to make bread. Barley offered the benefit of a high seed to yield ratio and was used for brewing malt for beer, fodder for livestock, and as a bread grain. As evidenced by it accounting for the highest density of any species in the Waterman macrobotanical assemblage, as well as the thorough recording of it in historical accounts and documents, the most prevalent grain consumed at the Waterman house was maize. This New World grain held not only nutritional value, but also social value and factored heavily into the regional trade economy. Uh, colonists processed and prepared maize using native methods of pounding kernels into meal in a large mortar. 
and the resulting maize flour would be cooked into a kind of porridge called samp, or nasamp, in Algonquin. Other indigenous maize dishes adopted by colonists included johnny cakes, which I'm sure most of us are familiar with, uh, no cake or parched corn, and succotash, corn and beans together. In his study of the Algonquin language and culture, Roger Williams also noted natives making strawberry bread with maize, which sounds delicious. So the second way that I analyzed this assemblage was by a comparison of new world to old world taxa. Um, I used the USDA plant database, and also I did consult the uh, herbals that I looked at very heavily, um, just because some of them were very detailed in their illustrations of the plants from the new old world. Uh, the results were initially striking. So this chart over here is everything all together. So it's way up there in new world. I was like, okay. So is my data being skewed? And of course, there were almost 2,000, yeah, almost 2,000 specimens of maize alone. I was like, okay, so I'll take all the grains out. And that's when I got this guy, which still confirms New World taxa were very much on their minds and in their bellies. Um, and in the study of food, um, it's pretty well understood that the adoption of new foods into a diet is often conservative and usually operates within specific parameters such as availability, cultural rules, and personal histories. So such a large divergence from this trend, uh, not even a full 20 years after the settlement of Plymouth, uh, was pretty curious. Uh, so that's when I broke the plant taxa down. And <laughs> honestly, looking at the non-grain taxa was very interesting too because while grains were and continued to be their principal food source, there is much more to a diet than bread and beer, even though some of us might disagree. So here we are. When grains were removed, as in the chart on the right, there's still a preference. And so I dug a little bit deeper. Considering such significant shifts in diet and cuisine do not occur in a vacuum, I began a thorough investigation of how English perceived and consumed new or familiar plant resources before they came to Plymouth Colony. Um, and I began consulting all the primary sources I could find. What I quickly learned from scholars studying early modern Europe, uh, including Joan Thirsk, who, that's the, her book cover in the middle, excellent book if you're interested, um, is that aside from the political and religious upheaval that occurred in England during the 16th and 17th centuries, this period of English history was also characterized by substantial shifts in medical and dietary theory. The Galenic or Hippocratic theory of the humors, with the phlegm, bile, all that delicious stuff, um, which had served the foundation of English medicine and European medical and dietary thought since the second century AD, competed with the teachings of Paracelsus, who has an excellent, has anybody heard of Paracelsus, by the way? So, thank you. <laughs> um, um, he has, I do want to say he has an excellent name other than Paracelsus. It's Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. Mm -hmm. That was really fun to type out multiple times. <laughs> I'm sorry? So he really kind of started the shift into more of our scientific medical theory. Um, he was still kind of well-versed in alchemy, but he started to have a shift away from thinking, oh, well, you've got black bi too much black bile, so you need to balance it out with, I forget what it is, if it's phlegm or the yellow bile. Um, he started to think more scientifically, and he inspired other scientists to start thinking better, thinking more clearly about their medical and dietary theory. This is in Europe. Yes. So, um, and I guess I should also mention, I'm going to get into it more as I go through here. One of the reasons I went back to before they came over was because things weren't, really weren't adding up when I was looking at the assemblage just as itself and only thinking Plymouth Colony. Also, there really aren't any comparative collections for me to work with, so I can't see the full shift in another site. So I was basically starting from square one. Um, and getting to go back into the 16th and 15th centuries in Europe was really interesting because it really does tie the threads together a little bit more. Um, during this time, 
Uh, English society also witnessed the arrival of a botanical renaissance during this period, brought about by these lively medical debates, several intense periods of famine, and when I say intense, I mean almost every two to three years they were having intense famines uh, where prices were skyrocketing, there was nothing to eat, you were eating bricks um, with your acorns. <laughs> um, authors like Hugh Platt and William Vaughn produced treatises on recommendations for mitigating that famine and it often included ways to make undesirable plants more palatable. Herbals or treatises on medicinal plants uh, reached their prime between 1530 and the 1640s and began to reflect the results of experiments carried out by European botanists. Uh, they were really interested in improving their old world plants, so um, John Winthrop Jr.'s list that lists new onion, those might be one of those improved varieties of onion that he was talking about. And also they were incorporating new world plants into English cuisine and medicine. And it's kind of funny reading some of the accounts from these botanists, they were really kind of over there sabotaging each other and trying to be the first to have every cool new plant, kind of got to catch them all. Um, the incorporation of new world plants into European dishes and remedies did not happen overnight, of course. Um, and through a survey of primary documents and research conducted by art and food historians, I pieced together the timeline uh, showing introductions of new world plants which occurred during the early modern period in England on this slide. Um, at the Waterman House site, maize, beans, squash, pumpkin, Jerusalem artichoke, and American strawberry are all taxa introduced early on in the age of exploration. Um, maize, beans, and squash arrived in Europe almost 100 years or more before the landing of the Mayflower in 1620. Jerusalem artichoke arrived later in 1605 with Samuel de Champlain, but quickly shed its status as an English garden novelty. Uh, basically, by around the time that, even before the pilgrims arrived in Plymouth, People are like, we're sick of this. Please stop growing this in your gardens. It's everywhere. <laughs> um, and, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so Jerusalem artichokes. Um, does, any, does anybody know what a Jerusalem artichoke is? Show of hands. Yeah, so for those that don't know, it's a, a relative of the sunflower. Um, and both their roots are consumed. It's almost like a potato. Um, and it's like a smaller sunflower head. Uh, but it was one of the crops that was brought over before the pilgrims came over to Europe. Um, and it became so prevalent in English gardens that people were really sick of it. <laughs> they really didn't want it anymore. <laughs> um, <clears throat> they even described them as even the vulgar or you know, poor working class people despise them. Jacques Cartier wrote of vast patches of strawberries along the Great River and in the woods during his 1534 vo voyage to Canada. And Thomas Harriet brought strawberry seeds from Virginia to Europe in 1586. Uh, but the first successful cultivation of the New World species of the plant is attributed to John Trabiscant the Elder in England circa 1618. And unlike the unevenly ripened fruits produced by the seeds brought by Harriet, his great Fergara did very well. While many of the aforementioned botanical texts and agricultural manuals published during this period became relatively accessible to working class society in England, it's very unlikely that every colonist had a copy of every herbal in their library when they came over. Um, a Dutch herbalist, um, his book is listed in the probate records of William Brewster and Miles Standish and perhaps acquired during their time in the Netherlands, but the owning of such a tome would not have been common. Um, however, much of this practical knowledge uh, actually began in folk beliefs and folk knowledges um, in the middle and lower classes of English society, or some of it would have trickled down from the upper classes by this point. The first applications of English botanical and agricultural knowledge in the New World are demonstrated in early explorer accounts like Bartholomew Gosnold's 1602 Exploration of Maine and Thomas Harriet's Voyage to Virginia. Both experimented with the cultivation of Old World crops during their expeditions. Some of their claims seem a little unlikely, like peas shooting up within three days and uh, you know, stuff like that. 
Um, and while these glowing reports of abundant plant resources are also reflected in primary sources from Plymouth Colony, their attempts to grow the European crop seeds they had brought were thwarted by the coastal Massachusetts ground and the climate. The subsequent alliance between the Wampanoag Confederacy and Plymouth Colony proved to be a critical turning point in the existence of the colony, and the ecological and horticultural knowledge imparted on colonists by their indigenous advisors built the foundation for agriculture in New England. And as colonists began to succeed in cultivating old world crops, uh, these uh, new world crops continued to be very prominent in their diet. The importance of maize in particular is reflected in historical documents, as I mentioned, and it's also seen in other 17th century colonial sites in Connecticut that I've looked at before. Not as extensive, extensive sites, but still heavily attributed with maize. Um, while scouring the complex body of botanical literature from this period, in addition to contemporary accounts written by colonists, early explorers, and observant visitors to the region, I began to notice trends in the way New World fruits, nuts, and weedy plants were described. Uh, John Jocelyn, uh, who was a very early visitor to the region, lists the plants he encountered during his travels, and they were extremely helpful. He broke them down to plants as are common with us in England, so plants that he recognized from old world environments, as are proper to the country, so only found in the new world, and then garden herbs amongst us as do thrive there, so they're old world herbs that would easily transplant over. Um, and in theory, there's a theory of you can submerge something um, and make it more palatable in colonial settings. And that's kind of what's happening here, um, because they're starting to recognize that these plants are from the same genus, um, even if they're different species. So for example, uh, this is gallium, so bed straw. It was used as a rennet substitute in dairying, um, some varieties, not all, um, and for straining out hair in cow's milk. So up here is the new world gallium. This is the old world gallium. They're basically identical. So if you're walking on the landscape in this new place that you're living in, you might be more likely to feel comfortable using it. And by recognizing new world species as equal, and in some cases, again, superior to, uh, this really challenges prior scholarship, painting Plymouth Colony as rigid. A lot of archaeologists and historians, they really, think, they really thought that the colonists approached this with disgust and mistrust when really this seems to reflect that there's something much more complex going on. Uh, this substantial divergence is already apparent in a consideration of this assemblage in its entirety. And as can be seen from the data on this slide, a comparison of the densities and ubiquities of the grain taxa recovered at Waterman further emphasizes its place, Mays' place in the colonial diet. Building upon the last question I posed at the beginning, uh, what does this data set tell us about how colonists perceived and adapted to a maize-based diet? The quick adoptions of maize by English colonists had previously been discussed to varying degrees by historians without any firm conclusions. Um, and or, like how and why this shift occurred. And much of this confusion is due to a majority of this prior scholarship citing unfavorable opinions of the crop like John Gerard's where he says, turkey wheat doth nourish far less than either wheat, rye, barley, or oats, and is of hard and evil digestion. <laughs> A more convenient food for swine than men. Lovely. <laughs> um, but really looking at the historical record and looking at Plymouth Colony accounts, what Gerard is missing is the indigenous knowledge of how to process maize. Um, Maize is very hard if you don't have the right tools uh, to turn into meal. We have all our modern things that we can use today, which is great. Back then they had their samps and all that jazz. Um, so John Gerard didn't know what he was missing out on, really. Historian Trudy Eden has attributed the adoption of maize into the colonial diet to the pilgrims embracing it as a gift from God, and claims that since it did not come in different grades or qualities as wheat did, served as a perfect medium for eliminating social rank and promoting a cohesive society. 
Other historians have attributed its success to more pragmatic reasons, like its high yield, the ease with which it is cultivated, and its use as a substitute for English grains in the early years and during the economic depression that occurred in the 1640s. And honestly, based on my own research, I would have to say all of these factors probably play a little bit of a part. Um, you know, initially it saved them and it fit well within their grain-based diet and it also fits well within their Puritan beliefs that surviving adversities, like the famine, uh, was a path to spiritual and moral improvement. Those Puritans. <laughs> and I really think that any initial dislike of the grain probably came to be an appreciation for it and an acceptance as they became more familiar with processing and eating it. So, we are almost closing in. Um, as those of you who have written a thesis, dissertation, or a significant body of research know, there is only so much one can fit within a given page limit. Um, I focused on food and identity for my masters, but plant remains offer insight into so much more, and I intend to explore some of those threads later on. I've already started on some of them. Uh, for instance, the Waterman House Macrobotanical Assemblage reflects the exchange of knowledge between English colonists and indigenous peoples. Included in such knowledge exchanges are words like those listed here on the site, on the slide, um, noted by Roger Williams. And there's also a really lovely example of Edward Winslow tending to Massasoit when he fell ill. Um, he ended up blending English and indigenous medicinal practices. He made him a pottage of strawberry leaves and sassafras, and it really connected and firmed up the relationship between the English and the Wampanoag. Um, and it's a very cool example. And also while conducting my research, I noticed that there may have been knowledge shared by not only Native Americans, but by English colonists as well. Mohegan medicine woman Gladys Tantaquidgen's 1972 book on indigenous medicinal uses of plants like the mayweed, common skull cap, white clover, and mullein recovered at Waterman are old world in origin and have overlapping indigenous English uses as shown by the slide on this table. So everything that is in bold, uh, those are overlapping between both English and indigenous uses. And that includes both old world and new world plants. So, for example, the cranberry that was found, scurvy, used by both parties. And actually, there might have been a cranberry intrageneric species over in England, but it's not really clear if they used it in England. Um, earlier accounts by European explorers make it clear that they sought the familiar in not only new world plants and animals, but in Native Americans as well. Contemporary accounts, especially early ones like Thomas Harriet in Virginia, uh, were likening indigenous plants, dishes, and social customs to those of the English, those of the indigenous peoples. Even if the comparisons were eventually twisted to allow for some colonial justifications of some atrocities. These cultural connections being made by explorers and colonists between themselves and indigenous peoples coupled with the aforementioned shifts in medical and dietary theory occurring in Europe at this time, may have really laid the foundation for this blending of foodways and medicinal practices. The other thread of research that I would really like to pursue is giving colonial women a voice. If you've done any genealogical research, you've tried to find your great, 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 great grandmother, there's almost nothing usually. Um, same is true of Elizabeth Waterman. As I said, there's very little known about her. But for instance, at the site, um, Ross Harper actually identified a little trampled area in front of the hearth that looked like it was probably where Elizabeth may have like, been continuously doing her cooking, which is a very cool little detail. And with the plants, um, there, Back then, they attributed medical uses to almost every single plant that went into your body, from carrots to violets. Um, mayweed is a really interesting example. John Jocelyn listed as an excellent herb for the mother. Does not go on to say what, but I'd like to track some of that down. And you can really start to see that these women were cultural brokers, they were housewives, they were the physicians of their communities before they actually had, you know, the big wig doctors come into the region 
um, they were caring for their families and their communities. And her status as a Yeoman's wife really makes her a good proxy to understanding women in the rest of Plymouth Colony. Furthermore, uh, Dr. Fred Dunford at the Plymouth Patuxent Museum has posited in personal communications and public forums that English women may have been doing the majority of, or a major part of the knowledge exchange with indigenous women in the fields as they work together, which I would really love to track some more of that down. So in conclusion, the Waterman House site macrobotanical assemblage serves as a testament to more than just a long list of plant taxa, thank you for bearing with me everyone, uh, being consumed by English colonists. It also acts as a bridge between the written history of European colonization of the Americas and the lived experiences of the colonists as they adapted and adopted plant foods to fit old world cuisine while living in the new world. Their maize-based diet supplemented with old world and new world crops and foraged plants was replicated for generations. First, because it really, it initially provided the solid sufficiency of food and plant-based products that they sought. And the English were not strangers to foreign foods due to the global colonization efforts which brought new world foods to their gardens, farms, and stomachs before the founding of Plymouth Colony. Furthermore, this quote from Bradford on this slide is particularly revealing in reference to the role of indigenous people in the formation of the colonial diet. Colonial accounts like William Woods mention a multitude of instances where Native Americans shared their knowledge of the locations of mineral, water, and animal resources. And considering this in tandem with these other earlier explorer accounts I discussed, it's easy to extrapolate the data to include plant resources among those pointed out by native informants. The colonial willingness to exercise food flexibility in times of dearth, contemporary English botanical knowledge, their personal histories with foreign plants, and their alliances with Native Americans culminated in planting the seeds of what would become the Yankee identity. And thank you to all of these wonderful people. And thank you to all of you. I will happily take questions, and again, I'm so sorry for the rough start, everyone. Um, I can be a little bit of a fast talker. Yes? You talked about the acorns that they ate. Were, did they eat all acorns, or were they particular white oak, red oak? Um, so with the, um, the specimens that were left, I can't really tell you which species of oak. Um, and I know, so uh, Bill Farley, if anybody knows him, um, he did a very, very small sample before I got to this assemblage for my master's. So he did identify, I think, white oak wood charcoal, but unfortunately I can't connect that to the acorn itself. Um, I'd have to have the whole acorn to tell you. How did they process the acorns? Uh, so they would have had to do um, Boiling and a little bit of like the you know do you know what nixtamalization is? Nixtamalization. Oh, that's fair. <laughs> um, it's basically you are mixing your what you're boiling with um, wood ash to try to get rid of the tannins in it because um, you can't just pop an acorn in your mouth, unfortunately. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and you could have dried them, but yeah. Yes. It's a tough word. <laughs> yeah, it's well, and that is a really interesting process because you can sort of trace um, maize d domestication throughout the United States as, along with that process and when they were starting to intensify. Um, and I haven't done a whole lot of research on it, I just know the basics on it, but it is very interesting. It's not done that. I'm no. Not, not by usage of yeah, I'm not doing it in my backyard. <laughs> yeah. It breaks down, um, so like, if you look at a corn kernel, yeah, like the outer shell, the shell essentially, we'll just call it that it breaks it down and makes it easier to chew, to grind, all of that jazz. I'm sorry? 
Sort of what harmony is. Yep. Yes. Can you just explain a little bit of the uh, fluidation process? I don't think anyone is familiar with how you go from all of that dirt to all of these little pieces. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, that is fair. Um, so the flotation process involves, well, there's a multitude of ways that you can do it, but essentially what you are doing is you're making dirt soup. Um, you have your soil sample and you put it into a screen if you're doing it by hand. That's how we do it at AHS. Um, and you agitate the soil by hand and then all your little goodies and bits bob up to the surface. That's called a light fraction and that's where a majority of my seeds came from. Um, there's also something called a float machine, which I think you guys have at PAL still had. Um, and it does the agitation for you. So you pour your soil sample into the uh, machine and it bubbles up so you don't have to work as hard with your hands. Um, and it separates everything out for you instead of you having to do what we do, which is collect with pantyhose. Um, both methods are great. I obviously got a lot of stuff out of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's interesting how many conversations I have about pantyhose now. Um, but essentially what you're doing is you're removing the soil from the seeds and your artifacts um, after you collect all your stuff. Is that a, a decent? Yeah. Yes? I was interested. You said um, a number of plants had gone from the new world, the old world, prior to the Philippines because there had been trade when well, early explorers bringing them back. So it's, it's, it's difficult sometimes to determine what is native here and there yeah. and separate out the two because they, and some of them have been around for a long time now. Yes. And have become naturalized. Yes. Um, there's actually a really lovely article, and I'm blanking on the author's name. It starts with an M. But he did an analysis of John Endicott's list and Winthrop Jr.'s lists and compared it to uh, invasive species that were identified in the region. Does anybody want to take a guess how many species had been introduced to the region by about the 1800s? Yeah. Yeah. Like about a thousand. Yeah. Um, and, you know, with further globalization, obviously, we're not going to fix that. Um, but you know, a lot of it came over with livestock. Um, a lot of it came over in seed packets that they brought over or ordered. Um, of course, you know, like I had both. It was an indeterminate goosefoot, which is like a quinoa relative, um, in addition to lamb's quarters, which is the old world version of it. And now uh, lamb's, ears, uh, lamb's quarters is prevalent throughout the region as well. Yeah, so like that's a good example. Um, like Malayne, um, does everybody know what Malayne looks like? Yeah, with the big stock. When fun fact, they actually used to use them as torches too. Um, but that's all over the place now, thanks to the English. Um, it's. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, so, so Christopher Columbus brought it over in 14, now I can't even read mine, 1493, um, so up here. And the first image of New World, like squash and gourds, uh, which is this beautiful piece over here, shows up in a prayer book in 1503 to 1508, um, which is pretty early. And actually, the first images of maize like being shown uh, show up in an Italian villa in Rome um, in 1515 to 1517. Um, but the thing about maize is, even though it was introduced so early in Europe, people really weren't interested. Um, you know, it fed the poor. It was a good famine food. Uh, but people really fought it over there. And I do still kind of wonder if people are like Gerard that they just didn't have the tools to process it properly. Um, and it doesn't really become something that is grown in a lot of gardens, at least not in England, until I want to say the mid to late 18th century. So it took a while. 
So from 1493 to 18th century, it's like ugh. Um, and you know, of course, here are all these, and I'm sure these guys contributed to the invasives as well. All those botanists doing their experiments, they were growing everything they could get their hands on. One guy stole another guy's plant and wrote all about it. Um, and it's really interesting to watch the evolution of those herbals. Um, I actually just got the first image of strawberry tattooed on me. Um, and while looking for this image to show it to my artist, I found <laughs> Um, a depiction of a mandrake root, and it's just as horrifying as if anybody's seen Harry Potter or you think of like a little human attached to a plant. It's terrifying. <laughs> um, and then they become these really beautiful scientific pieces that are improved upon and talk about the virtues and when they grow and where they grow. They're wonderful, um, but they start out pretty rough. <laughs> It's a really interesting story. So that happened before I was working at AHS. Um, they excavated this back in 2013. Um, and they were doing preparation for section 106 work, if you're not familiar, is where archaeologists go in and make sure there's nothing culturally sensitive or important uh, before a project goes through. Um, and so for the Marshfield Airport, they were doing their surveys. They found several other components. Um, but all they found that was even a hint of the Waterman House were, I think, like one or two redware sherds and then maybe a piece of bottle glass. But they were really just, it, the signature was not there. Um, and so, you know, because of the other sites, they had to come back. And I think initially they had 25 or 30 units set aside for this project and it ended up becoming 134 <laughs> um, because they started to come down on features, which are like the hearth and the, and the cellar and all that jazz. Um, but really, there was almost no indication if they hadn't done the, the secondary phase of excavation um, and expanded on that. So how did you find out whose house it was? A lot of land deed research. <laughs> um, so one of the, I got very, very lucky getting this as my master's thesis site. Um, Ross and Meg and the whole team at AHS, they do really detailed deep dives into land deeds and probate records. Um, and they were able to place the Watermans in this house. Um, again, it was probably one of their secondary homes. It was very common practice uh, for uh, Plymouth Colony members to have multiple houses. Um, so like, there's a little bit of that trickiness to it. Uh, but very highly detailed land re deed research. Was that um, multiple houses being one? They had a winter house in Plymouth and then some <laughs> one where they had a farm? Or were they actually. Yeah. In, it's my understanding that in the beginning, yes, it was that kind of setup. Set up. Um, but then also there were your smaller houses that might be closer to your field. And then again, they had four sons. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth was keeping track of four sons that were pretty close in age. Um, and you don't want them running underfoot of this, while well, you're in this very tiny house. Because it's, like, it's a big enough house to live in, but it's not gigantic. Um, so you would have had to have a little more space. And probably some winterizing was dealt with that. Because the other thing about the house, um, again, going back to the palisaded walls, um, is AHS interprets those as windbreaks. Because if you are standing on this location, we did a different project there, um, like I think two or three years after I started there, and you just get buffeted. It's awful. And without having even, like, and that's with having the airport in front of you and having houses around you. Um, so to be the first person settling that area, you're going to get slammed. And then you, your house catches on fire, <laughs> which is very common. Uh, because that was the land that was granted to them. Um, and Robert Waterman's father-in-law, he gave them the land and the house when they got married. So you know, for Robert, who really kind of came to the colonies with nothing, um, you know, he couldn't own land until he got married. And you know, Thomas, um, her, her father gave that to him. 
Um, so you kind of worked with what you could have. And also, if you think about it, in England, most of these folks were crushed into urban areas or even like the more rural areas. There wasn't a whole lot of land that hadn't been exhausted yet. So all of a sudden, you have this rich marshland laying out before you. Yes, your house might catch on fire. You're getting buffeted by wind. But you can farm, and you can feed your family, and you can have space. And yeah. And they were all about improving that land. So what did the house look like? I mean, was it one room downstairs with the kitchen? How many downstairs? Was it It was um, mostly one room. Uh, I, it's my understanding that there was a a wall here. So there's a post, a post, a post. Um, so there's probably something um, coordinating off the pantry and the cellar and all that jazz. Um, but mostly your activities are here in your fire room, your living space, all of that. Um, I am so sorry. I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, it so let's see. I would have to look that up for you. I'm so sorry. I'm not an architectural historian. <laughs> oh, is it in the description? Twenty by sixteen. There you go. What was that again? Twenty by sixteen. Twenty by sixteen. Yeah. Real cozy. Mm -mm. No. So this reconstruction, there might have been um, maybe some storage space, but I kind of doubt it. Yeah. So she raised four sons in the 16 by 20 space. Yeah. But you know, of course, if it's not the winter time, then even in the winter, they constantly had work to do. There's always agricultural work to do. There's tools to take care of. So you're busy pretty much all the time. But yeah, it's still a lot of people in a house. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. Any thank you. Well, Catherine, thank you so much. That thank you. Really cool. <laughs> and again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience with me, everyone. Um, I really That's appreciate you all great. having me here. Really thank great. you. I'm going to stay here. We'll get some pictures. Yes. And um, I just want to remind everybody that our last speaker is going to be on November 30th. It's Professor De Cesare, whose topic is the American ship John Jay. OK, so this is going to be our last uh, speaker on, the, on November 30th. OK, so anyway. Um, Thank you for coming. And until next time, happy Thanksgiving. Happy, happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. OK. OK, we get some work. OK. Lisa. Lisa? Hmm? Lisa?